no, 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 no. It's out of control. No, no, no. no. Look, look, I know. It's, the, the, no, it's really gotten out of hand. I, I know no, it. You have no idea who you're dealing with here. These guys don't play around, man. I, I, I mean hey, it. Hey, I hear you. I know these guys are for real. We need to keep it on the up and up, though. And, you know, and just smile and wave. You know what I mean? I mean, because... Buddy, I warned you about this weeks ago. Hey, are you recording? The red the red light's on over there. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Are you crazy? No, 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 no. Listen, I want to have some kind of proof that this thing is actually going on. Because if something weird goes down and, uh, you know... I. T- just between you and me. Things are getting pretty weird right now. Even I know that. Whatever. This is looking like a train wreck of mammoth proportions, man. I'm, I'm just telling you. All right, I tell you what. Best thing to do, maybe, is just get the show started. Let, all me, right, all right. let me get the show started, and then we'll, we'll confab about this later. Yeah, Fair. whatever. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, and welcome, one and all, once again, to Fusebox. This is show number 20, Flukem. Here we are once again with another steaming hot helping of ear food for you on this edition of Fusebox. I'm your host, Mark Rose, ably assisted by Milt Keynes at the controls over there. Present and accounted for. So, uh, yeah, this has been a interesting couple of weeks. Um, it's got me thinking about an issue that I'm sure all of us have encountered one time or another, or maybe more than another and another. And that is the obsolescence of technology. See, I had this laptop. I don't mind telling you. It was an Apple laptop that I've had for about seven years. Yes, I know, you're shuddering at that thought. The darn thing just kept going. It was a great little unit. I had no issues with it, really, until like the last couple of years where things started to cough up blood and fall over. And uh, such is what happened this most recent time, except it isn't recovering from this. This was a pretty massive failure. Luckily, everything was backed up and all that good stuff. But it got me to thinking that in spite of this particular unit that had seven years of history on it, you know, folks, we seem to be asked now on a pretty regular basis to just casually imagine a two or three thousand dollar investment as being disposable. Now, I know that the software folks and all that, they they want us to have the latest greatest all the time because the latest greatest all the time takes advantage of all the new resources and all the latest greatest new machines and all that. I totally understand that. What I don't totally understand is why they might purposely build things that will not function on machines older than three years. There definitely is a a, a more than subtle trend to get us all to kind of trade everything in all of a sudden. Now, if there were ways of doing that and you could actually recoup some of your investment, I'd I'd say that was great. But there really aren't that many options for us out there. It's like driving the car off the lot. It's just devalued by two thirds by the time you've gotten off the parking lot. So I was confronted with this dilemma and 
you know, I just, it just struck me that, well, I don't know that that's such a hot idea. I mean, some of this technology and that little laptop certainly was functioning fine. It was doing everything I wanted it to do, except that, you know, <laughs> there are parts in there that are bound to go. Now, in my case, seven years, that's two years longer than it should have gone and about four years longer than they would have wanted. That is the truth and we know it, right? Yes, absolutely. So, I just don't know about it. It just seems to me that it's, a, it's, it's asking a lot of the consumer base to just casually toss that thing into the trash heap or a reclamation site or whatever. Bearing in mind also that some of these devices that are being built right now, why you can't even replace some of the parts in there. I'm thinking of one small feather-like device that once that battery goes, you're done. I don't know. It's just one of those things, and it made me a little crazy. Spotlight on Phil. I just love Mr. Warp. You know what I mean? It fills me with delight. Does it, does it fill you with that? Yeah, very nostalgic in a kind of queasy way. I just, yeah. It just brings back all those memories of like the Encyclopedia Britannica films of the 1950s that were all sort of pink. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's great. Well, folks, we are going to talk about, albeit briefly, a wonderful little documentary I had a chance of seeing. And by the way, yes, there is a trend in all of these spotlight on film segments. I'm not going to talk about films I don't like. <laughs> Why would I waste your valuable time talking about something you don't need to see? This one is certainly interesting. And if uh, you are a musician or even just like music in general, I think you will find this one very intriguing. It's called Deconstructing Dad... And it is a documentary on the life and mysterious goings-on with one Raymond Scott, who was a musician, composer, and inventor, and developer of what some might argue, me included, was the first synthesizer ever built, the Clavivox. This film it was uh, produced and was a project and pretty much a one-man band kind of concoction by his son, Stan Warnow. And uh, he decided to make this documentary uh, after delivering a eulogy for his father at his memorial service back in 1994. And really on the surface, that's not quite as macabre as you might think. It, it's often noted that people who are in creative fields or sciences or anything that, that requires a lot of attention uh, sometimes become uh, disassociated from their families pretty easily. Uh, even Frank Zappa had this particular affliction because the work is very consuming and it takes you out of your entire family unit. And many of your family members feel a little distance because, well, you're unavailable. You may be present, but you're unavailable. And that's kind of what happened here because uh, Raymond Scott was very much involved in the mechanical process of inventing and composing and doing all that kind of stuff. And it was very consuming and every bit as much as it still is today, even though this guy was uh, working back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and so forth. But this uh, self-produced documentary features interviews with composer John Williams, who, by the way, his father, John Williams' father, was the drummer in, in Raymond Scott's quintet, it uh, also features uh, some brief clips with Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo, who, of course, has done countless soundtracks and all sorts of stuff. A co-inventor of the Moog synthesizer, Herb Deutsch, and a turntablist, and there's a word for you, producer and author Paul D. Miller, also known as DJ Spooky, and a wonderful archival insert with Edward R. Murrow interviewing Scott in his lab. I mean, it's almost worth it just for that. This documentary has served beautifully well to uh, reintroduce the genius and 
inventiveness of Raymond Scott back into the mainstream where he was nearly forgotten. And I think many still are not remembering him. Certainly, I think even if this name doesn't seem to ring a bell, you have heard his music because in the mid-40s, early 50s, Raymond licensed his music to Warner Brothers and specifically to Carl Schaling. The truth be known, Raymond Scott didn't know what it was going to be used for specifically, but uh, Schaling picked it up and, of course, quickly embedded it in cartoons, most specifically Looney Tunes cartoons. And so tracks like this... were heard endlessly. And uh, as a side note, John Chris Falusi, creator of Ren and Stimpy, also loved Scott's work and used his tracks consistently in the Ren and Stimpy cartoons. When you think about it, that too was placing a little blip on the radar screen of modern day audiences. So we've, we've had reminders that uh, Raymond Scott's presence has never really left us. One of the things that just fascinated me because I've always read about this thing and was always curious about it. Uh, It includes some peeks into his incredible musical inventions, such as the world's first polyphonic synthesizer, the Clavavox, which I mentioned earlier, which could, this may get a little geeky here for a second, but it can generate musical tones like a synthesizer could, but it allowed the composer to play multiple notes at one time, which at that point in time was impossible. Even for Moog, it was impossible until years later. And not only could you play multiple notes at one time, you could bend them sort of um, dynamically. So you could get a true vibrato or a tremolo or a glissando or that note that goes from really high to really low or backwards, whatever. You could do that by pressure, which is something that didn't really come into synthesizers until the late 80s, really. So at least polyphonically. And this, this, this guy was playing with this right out of the box in the early 60s. So you could get really lyrical performances. And uh, then... He creates this thing called the Electronium, which is a box that basically took the, as he put it, drudgery of composition (laughs) out of that process. And it was probably what we could easily call right now the very first artificial intelligence sequencer. Because what this box did was randomly generate patterns that the composer then could take and rearrange and tweak and do all sorts of things. This box miraculously survived numerous storages and cannibalizations by Scott himself, but it survived and uh, was purchased by Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo, who was a big Raymond Scott fan, along with Danny Elfman, the composer, who also is a very big Raymond Scott fan. So this this device was sitting in his uh, offices in uh, Mutato Music in, in Los Angeles, but it didn't work. It's been pretty much dead for a long time. So interestingly enough, this box is now being restored here in Portland by a gentleman by the name of Darren Davison, who apparently worked for Nike or something. I don't know. But uh, he is with great care and loving detail, uh, basically restoring this thing so it actually works and makes a noise. In the documentary, he's talking about the fact that it took him over a year just to copy the circuits. Because there's a picture of this thing from the back, and you can see the circuit cards that uh, Raymond Scott had put in there, and it'll blow your mind. The meticulous row after row after row after row. This thing is as big as a bookcase. It's, you know, it's it looks like a cockpit to an airplane. And it has, like, these three major sections, and the center section, evidently, is is where all the keys and arpeggiation and so forth can start. And then on the left and right consoles, you have tempos and variety of, you know, adjustments. It's quite the box, but being restored. The other little anecdote about the the electronium, which is uh, quickly brought out in this documentary too, is that then president of Motown Records, Barry Gordy, commissioned 
Raymond Scott to build one of these beasts for Motown Records because they thought the idea of a thing that could compose music all by itself <laughs> was an amazing idea. <laughs> so, and you can fill in the blanks there. But uh, he did build one. They did get installed, but it was a very problematic venture, apparently, and it didn't work out in the, in the end. But uh, very interesting, because they actually put Raymond Scott on the payroll there for a while. Like This was in the 70s by that time. This documentary is, is co-produced by Jeff Winner, who uh, also maintains the Raymond Scott website and archives and has been, you know, quite active spreading the word about Scott. I seem to recall reading on Winner's site years ago that uh, a film was in the works, and that may have been actually six years ago, come to think of it, and uh, was really eager to see it. And uh, I guess they managed to get their stuff together, put it out, and by the way, not disappointed. And I don't think you will be either. Uh, the extras on the disc are fabulous. You get some extended interviews uh, with many of the people who are profiled in it. So, Raymond Scott, Deconstructing Dad, a film by Stan Warno. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, another healthy living reminder from Fusebox. Don't be that chick. Thank you very much. Next, please. Good morning. What can I get for you? Oh, uh, hi. Um, I don't know. I guess I'll have a blueberry muffin. If it's made with real blueberries. And is it gluten-free? It has to be gluten-free because I don't eat gluten. Especially if it's artificial gluten. Ugh. Artificial gluten is so unhealthy. In fact, all gluten is evil, so I refuse to eat gluten. Any gluten. In fact, gluten isn't even allowed in my house. So, yes, I want a blueberry muffin if you guarantee it's gluten-free. So no gluten. Do you understand? Do you? Hmm? Do you understand? Tell me you understand. Say it. Say it. My muffin is gluten-free. My muffin is gluten-free. Say it. You dirty whore. Fucking bitch. Fucking gluten-eating bitch, whore! Your muffin has gluten in it, doesn't it? Doesn't it? You want me to eat gluten, don't you? You hope I eat gluten and die, don't you? Don't you? Ha! I'll bet you eat gluten all the time. You probably love gluten, don't you, you little gluten whore? Gluten whore? We have a gluten whore here, people! Gluten whore! Ah, uh, yes. And uh, once again, dear friends, a reminder to submit materials to us. Any ideas you might have for folks you'd like to see featured in a don't be that guy, don't be that chick segment. Um, we have gotten a few and uh, we'd, you know, love to see more. So if you have some, please go ahead and send that along to Fusebox at FuseAudioDesign.com. And if we select one of the ones you have sent, we will send you something thrilling. Don't you think? Positively? Don't you think? Your life will be instantly made better. Yeah from the fuse box store i'm sure you're going to enjoy that so yeah more of those coming your way pretty soon so uh, uh wait, wait a minute huh are you hearing that what well you know actually i thought <laughs> i thought i did but i thought it was just me bumping this thing because it's it's always in the way so uh but what oh for crying out loud what, what the is, hell that? is that 
You want me to check that out, man? Uh, yeah. Do you, do you mind? I mean, I'm sure things will be fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, we can we can hold forth here a bit, I'm sure, without the able-bodied uh, hands on the controls of Milk Keynes as he checks out whatever the hell that is. All right. Um, back in a sec. Thank you. So, you know, <laughs> I, over the last few shows, I swear, it, it's starting to feel like one of those paranormal shows, for crying out loud. You know what I mean? I promise, though, we're not going to be suddenly camping in the woods and weeping uncontrollably in front of the camera. I, you, oy. Anyway, I would like to take this free-form opportunity to... Uh, thank some of the folks who have corresponded with us here. And I, I got to say, uh, this is <laughs> extremely gratifying. Back in the day when we were doing this before, um, we weren't we weren't hearing from South Africa. I, I just <laughs> I have to say, South Africa, England, Scotland, the Netherlands, Norway, uh, a buddy of mine in New Zealand. This is great. Um, again, and like I said, this is fuel for the fire, folks. Uh, any one of us who does a show like this, when we get any sort of correspondence from anybody who says, you know what, that was pretty cool, I like that, really, really helps. Uh, gets us juiced for the next thing, in spite of what may be going on, you know what I'm saying? So thank you so much for your words of encouragement and laughter. and. Uh, hey, uh, sorry, man. Um, you, you didn't have a little accident with some water in the kitchen. Huh? What? What are you doing here? Shouldn't you be out there? Uh, n no. Why? Well, there's a pretty big puddle in there, and then a trail leading out into the foyer, and I guess upstairs, too. It's a little hard to tell, but it's it feels kind of damp. A, tr a trail? Yeah. It's not a busted pipe or anything, if that's what you're thinking. It just looks like a big spill. In a sloppy attempt to clean it up, maybe. <laughs> all right. Well, all right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's take a look later, okay? Thank you. All right. That's cool. Um, Sorry. Well, you know, this just gets me on a track here, folks. I, I got to tell you something. You know, if you've been following along over the the, the last few weeks... There, there's been some weird stuff going on here. Whoa, whoa! And, you know, and it, and it, and, and it. Don't be going there. No, 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 no. You know what? No, really, seriously. At this point, I, I'm wanting a more obvious document of of what's going on here. You know, buddy. I mean, I'm feeling a little penned in for crying out loud. This, this way, at least, we have a chronicle. Of what's going on, hey, and, hey, and we're not uh, the only ones then who know about it. You know, leave a paper trail, leave a, f a physical trail of some kind. Uh, no, no, really. Hey! No. So, are you going to go on strike? Not funny, man. So look, friends, here's the deal. Back a few weeks ago... Uh, some odd things started to happen around here, and if you've been listening for a while, then you know that the Japanese pocket squirrels have been, well, they have seen to it to kind of transcend precocious and head straight for downright scary. We find them doing odd transmissions at night, right? First a podcast. Then some really creepy communication to who knows who. I discovered this, what looks like, a, a Sputnik-like thing, a, this circular thing and i i thought it was cute right and you know kind of clever these these little critters you know they I... but then then we capture them on the security camera late at night at the fridge going for ice <laughs> And that could be 
anything. I know, I know, that could be anything. You know, I know. But the capper, the capper, is really this morning. When I Man. got... Shh. When I got into the studio here, I check the voicemail, okay, and I find this. My name is unimportant, who we work for even less so, but we know who you are and we know what you're building. Be advised that unless you cease immediately, you will be paid a visit by us. Okay, so, so now I'm officially concerned about whatever the hell is going on here, and I want all of you folks to be witness to all of it, just, just in case... So something occurs that is much less than delightful for your humble host and associate, okay? Certainly weirder things have happened. So that's, that's it. That's all I'm going to say right now. That's where we are, and that's the fourth wall coming away, and here we are, okay? Yeah, so now I feel a little better about that. You feel worse. Buddy, worse ain't half of it. Yes, of course. But I, I'm, i yeah, at least everybody's in on it. So we got friends out there and, you know, that's all I'm saying. So let's lighten it up, shall we? I would think that would be a good idea. And I think it's time for the big guy. It's Timo's World. It's a special delivery for Timo. That can't be good. Hi, uh, we got a delivery for Mr. Timo. <laughs> Sign here, please. <laughs> Thanks, Mac. Good luck. Congratulations on your purchase of the IKEA Ergonomic Dual Shelf Book Storage System. This easy-to-follow audio instruction cassette will make putting your IKEA Ergonomic Dual Shelf Book Storage System a breeze to put together. So, let's get started. <laughs> First, make sure all the necessary and unnecessary parts are present. <laughs> They are? Good. <clears throat> now take base A and place horizontally on a non-vertical floor surface facing east to west. <clears throat> Next, locate shelf B and, while rotating counterclockwise, position shelf F aligning the non-aligning holes with the left side cabinet wall marked Q4. <clears throat>
calculating the circumference of the octangular proctologist as shown in figure 27. <laughs> now, spread the lubricant liberally on all metal hinges named Steve. <clears throat> Making sure to pass the right-handed salad fork's left, skipping on Scotch dandelion hardbark, one Mississippi as indicated on the back side of the front panel, shown on the back diagram not shown throughout the enclosed manual. Once you have twice secluded the fifth dimension in the age of Aquarius, pass the Dutchie on the left-hand side, tail and run as constipated. Borrow a cup of sugar, designated driver O Unique One Two, and donkey punch the dirty Sanchez until the shell falls in place in a safe, sane, and consensual manner. <laughs> Bases loaded and one out, draw the infield in to cut down the runner trying to score from third. This will allow the Plymouth Barracuda to join forces with the Germans and ensure a proper area in accordance with Sector 7G of the reclamation of Indy Square Dance with one nation blunder glob reprehensible with misery and products for True fantasy, right? I mean, no one has ever experienced an assembly nightmare from one of those uh, some assembly required situations. You know what I mean? It's never happened. Well, special thanks to our collaborators in audio crime for this edition of Fusebox. Nancy Munson and Jeff Pollard and Tara Timothy the able technical assistance of Milt Keynes and a, a long distance shout out to buddy Chainsaw Chuck Majewski for introducing me to the Raymond Scott website in the first place. Thank you so much, Chuck. Do check out scottdoc.com for more info on the Deconstructing Dad documentary. And while you're shopping around and doing things like that, please head over to the Fusebox store located at FuseAudioDesign.com and just click on the friendly store button to immediately fulfill all your fantasies all at once. We promise. Thanks once again for pushing play, my friends, and until our next cartoon. Fuse.